coming up today, making one of the biggest economic decisions of the year. The US Federal Reserve keeps rates unchanged at near zero. Despite widespread protests and scuffles in Parliament, Japan is set to pass controversial security bills that will tear up the country's post-war pacifist constitution. Plus, weighed down by low global oil prices, Korea's producer prices fall at the fastest rate in more than 16 years. In August, stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Friday, the 18th of September. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Arirang TV. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. We start with the highly anticipated economic news out of the United States. The Federal Reserve has decided to keep its benchmark interest rate unchanged at near zero, citing slow inflation growth. Guan Zua has the details. The speculation is over, for now at least. The U.S. Central Bank froze its key interest rate Thursday following a two-day policy meeting with only one out of ten committee members opposing the move. This despite the U.S. economy on a recovery track through robust spending and declining unemployment. Fed Chairwoman Janet Yellen said she expects the U.S. economy to continue to perform well, but that recent global market volatility and other factors are delaying what would be the first rate hike in a decade. Inflation, however, has continued to run below our longer-run objective, partly reflecting declines in energy and import prices. Yellen said a rate liftoff will come when there is more confidence of inflation rising to 2 percent, the previous target of the central bank. U.S. inflation currently stands at around 1.2 percent. Analysts say the U.S. also had to consider effects on developing countries as a hike would have crushed the purchasing power of developing nations. And if we have the emerging markets starting to struggle and we're not able to export goods and we're not able to create some sort of global inflation by a growing economy around it, that's going to be trouble for the U.S. economy as well. Korea, one of those emerging countries, had its concerns too, with foreign investors recently pulling out of Korean stocks. The delay could provide some relief for the market. If the interest rate increases, it will happen gradually. So I don't think Korea will be affected that much. Korea's vice finance minister said uncertainties will continue for the time being. And Korea's central bank chief said there could be a chance of a hike in October or December, which raises questions whether Korea will also raise its key interest rate this year. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Korea's producer prices in August fell at their sharpest rate in 16 and a half years due largely to low global oil prices. The Bank of Korea said Friday that the producer price index came in at 100.88 last month. This is down 4.4 percent from the previous year, extending its downward streak to a 13th straight month. Utilities, including electricity, gas and tap water fees, dropped a combined 10.6 percent from the previous year. The price index covering manufactured goods was 7 percent lower compared to August of last year, while the index covering agricultural products gained 4.4 percent. Japan's last 70 years of pacifism looks set to go up in smoke after a set of controversial security bills passed a key parliamentary committee on Thursday. Now, despite widespread protests outside parliament and scuffles inside, Japan's ruling coalition, led by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, is pushing to have the upper house approve the bills later today. Isuan reports. Japan's upper house panel has approved controversial new legislation allowing the deployment of troops abroad for the first time since World War II. Opposition party members pushed and shoved to prevent the bill's advance until the full session at the upper house, but to no avail. The ruling Liberal Democratic Party, led by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, skipped the scheduled question session after finally forcing the bills through. We absolutely cannot accept this. It truly ignores the voice of the people. The committee's vote clears the way for the bill to go to the upper house of parliament for final approval. 
The opposition vowed to submit a vote of no confidence to delay the legislation until the Diet disperses on September 27th. Abe's ruling coalition enjoys a two-thirds majority in the upper house, and it's expected that the legislation will be approved by parliament. Meanwhile, thousands of anti-military protesters gathered outside the parliament shouting scrap war legislation. All of a sudden, a parliament member got up and security legislation was passed. I felt a strong sense of anger and uncertainty. Despite opposition from many politicians and the population, Abe's government maintains that the revised legislation is vital for dealing with the modern challenges Japan is facing. If the upper house refuses to take up the bills, a second vote in the lower house can pass them into law with a two-thirds majority. Lee Soo-in, Arirang News. Now, Korea and Japan are holding another round of talks to resolve a decades-old historical issue that still divides the two countries. Hopes are high the two sides will set a friendly tone for the upcoming Korea-China-Japan talks. But, as our Han Dan reports, sticking points remain. The Foreign Ministry's Director General of the Northeast Asia Affairs Bureau, Yi sang Dog, and head of the Japanese Foreign Ministry's Asian and Oceanian Affairs Department, Junichi Ihara, met to resolve issues surrounding Japan's sexual enslavement of Korean women during World War II. This is the ninth round of talks on the so-called comfort women issue, which first took place in Seoul 2014. With a trilateral summit among leaders of Korea, China and Japan expected at the end of next month, pundits say Yi and Ihara will make their best attempt to iron out differences this time around. But sticking points remain. The first being Japan's sincerity and style of apology. Tokyo remains reluctant to acknowledge or apologize for its past wrongdoings, claiming they've already apologized through the 1993 Kono Statement. Seoul does not accept the Kono statement as a true apology, demanding a direct and sincere apology from Japan's government and prime minister. Second is the matter of compensation. Japan says it provided compensation through a civil organization in 1995, but Korea is arguing for more comprehensive, government-level compensation for the victims who had to endure Japan's horrifying wartime atrocities. Experts predict foreign ministers of the two neighboring countries will likely hold talks on the sidelines of the ongoing UN General Assembly soon. Attention is now focused on whether Korea and Japan will be able to make a breakthrough on the decades-old issue before the leaders of the two countries meet for the planned trilateral summit. Han Dan, Asian News. Korea's Prime Minister Hwang kyo an met with his French counterpart in Paris on Thursday, where the two sides agreed to fully cooperate in the so-called creative economy. Hwang is in the French capital for a five-day trip to mark the 130th anniversary of Korea's diplomatic ties with France, uh, which falls next year. Also shared views on bilateral relations with Manuel Valls. The Prime Ministers introduced each other's creative economy programs for innovative technology startups while also discussing cooperation in areas of culture, trade and future industries. After the talks, the two countries signed a set of agreements to shorten the time it takes to issue visas to Korean and French business people and to extend the duration of student visas from one to two years. Over now to the ongoing refugee crisis in Europe and Croatia, which has become the latest pressure point in the crisis, says it's overwhelmed by a sudden influx of refugees after Hungary sealed its border. All eyes are on what measures European leaders will take during an emergency meeting in Brussels set for next week. Son Jong-in has more. Thousands of refugees have been pouring into Croatia since Wednesday after they were forced to seek a different route into Western Europe. Hungary, which was their previous route, closed its border while police used tear gas and water cannons to keep refugees from entering. Unlike Hungary's crackdown, neighboring Croatia promised refugees safe passage. But the goodwill gesture did not last long. Overwhelmed by several thousand people crossing the border in less than 24 hours, Croatian authorities declared that it could no longer admit any more refugees. Our capacity is absolutely full. We are asking from them that all countries on the way, on the route, that means Greece, Macedonia and Serbia, they have 
to respect all contracts. Scuffles broke out in some areas on the border with Serbia when refugees pushed through police lines and people trampled and fell on each other. Uh, it's closed before we, we arrive, so we come to here. To Croatia? To Croatia. Yeah. And then Slovenia. We don't know about Slovenia actually, but we, we hope that we can cross to Germany. The European Parliament has voted in favor of a new plan to relocate 120,000 asylum seekers among member countries in an effort to relieve overcrowding in some border nations. They urge opposing Eastern European nations to support the plan, which needs a final approval from EU interior ministers. We need to act now, and I do bow before this Parliament for taking the political responsibility to vote today. With the crisis building, the European Council has called an emergency meeting for Wednesday in Brussels to discuss how to deal with the ongoing crisis. It remains to be seen whether the leaders, who have been unable to agree for months, will manage to reach a compromise this time. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Chile has declared a state of emergency in the coastal town of Coquimbo a day after the nation was struck by an 8.3 magnitude earthquake. That's according to local media reports following a visit by President Michelle Bachelet on Thursday. The government says hundreds of homes were so damaged, as you can see. The residents were unable to return by late Thursday afternoon and nearly 90,000 homes remain without power. The quake, the strongest in the world so far this year, killed at least 11 people. The government has ordered evacuations of coastal areas, seeking to avoid a repeat of the 2010 quake when the authorities' lax response was partly blamed for the massive death toll. And now to America, where Republicans have failed in another attempt to block the Iran deal. Senate Republicans tried to pass an amendment on Thursday which would have required Tehran to recognize Israel and release American prisoners held captive in the country. But the GOP was unable to muster the 60 votes required, losing 53 to 45. They also narrowly failed to get 60 votes in a separate disapproval resolution vote. Now, this is the third attempt in eight days, and the 60-day window Senate Republicans had to block the deal in Congress has now come to an end. The deal is designed to reduce Iran's nuclear activities in exchange for the lifting of sanctions and will come into effect next month. Now, Korea is fast becoming a mover and shaker in the lucrative trainer fighter jet market. The country has inked a multi-million dollar deal with Thailand and ha has even got plans to sell to the world's biggest defense spender, the United States. Kim Hyun bin reports. Korea will sell four of its T-50 trainer jets to the Thai government in a deal worth some 110 million U.S. dollars. Korea Aerospace Industry says it will deliver the jets within 30 months of the contract which was signed on Thursday. The jets will likely replace Thailand's aging fleet of L-39 jets that the Southeast Asian country has been using for the past three decades for mostly training purposes. With the deal, there's a high possibility Bangkok will purchase a further 20 T-50 jets in the future. Kai says the deal further boosts Korea's reputation as a top regional producer of high-level trainer jets. Thailand becomes the fourth country to take the T-50 after Indonesia, Iraq, and the Philippines. Kai and the U.S. defense firm Lockheed Martin finished development of the jets in 2005, pouring some $1.7 billion into the project. Experts also believe Korea could start to make inroads into the highly lucrative U.S. market, as Washington is planning to acquire 1,000 trainer jets worth more than $32 billion. The U.S. is expected to announce its selection in 2017. Korea Aerospace Industries, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman are among the defense companies competing for the piece of the pie. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. The head of South Korea's football governing body arrives in North Korea today on a four-day trip, as well as attending the East Asian Football Federation Executive Committee meeting in Pyongyang. Jong mong gyu president of the Korea Football Association, will hold talks with North Korean officials on holding an inter-Korean friendly match. It marks the first trip to North Korea by a KFA chief in well over 15 years. The most recent of the so-called unification football matches was held in 2005. Korean footballer Son Hung Min has scored his first goals for his new side, Tottenham Hotspur. The 24-year-old striker who signed for the London club in the summer bagged twice 
in Tottenham's 3-1 home victory over Azerbaijani side FK Karabakh in the Europa League. Son will be looking to score his first English Premier League goal on Sunday when Tottenham take on Crystal Palace. Well, that's all we have for now. I'm Mark Broom. Have a great weekend. And thank you, as always, for tuning in. And we do hope to see you at the same time on Monday. Until then, goodbye.